Let's have an intelligent conversation about an incredibly dense album. <laughs> What's up? You're watching Hive Mind, the most musical show on the internet. My name is Riley Zondrud, by my tone deaf co-host, Graydon. New York! Kendrick Lamar's new album, Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers, is out now, and we're gonna talk about it. Here's how these videos work. We're gonna give our best and worst on five different categories. First, we're gonna do lyrics, then we're gonna do features, then we're gonna do beats, then samples, and then overall songs. And of course, we'll talk broadly about the album throughout. Yes. Before we do it, make sure you like the video, subscribe if you wanna see more, HiveMindTV.com for our merch. We also got a Patreon down there, a Cameo down there, and we've got a show June 4th. Tickets are on sale for that right now. All of that is in the description, but let's get right into it. Let's do it. For a little bit of background on us, we've been Kendrick Lamar fans for a very long time and have yes. shared many experiences together listening to the music. Yes, we have. Starting with Good Kid, Mad City. His favorite album is Damn. Yep. My favorite is To Pimp a Butterfly, but mm -hmm. I think Good Kid, Mad City is also basically a perfect 10 out of 10. Yeah. So. Kendrick albums are always like a timestamp in my life. Yeah. You know, as they come out, something changes. Mm -hmm. I, my perspective changes. Same with this one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a dense one. So. Big time. Going in order of the track list. We've got the first lyrics here. I've been going through something. 1,855 days. Referencing his break between Damn and this album's release, right? Yes, the exact okay. number of days, which I think is interesting. Yeah. Because then he knew his release date for this album. Yeah. When writing this song. It's very strategic, very planned out. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And honestly, for a second, I thought this was a rent interpolation. 1,855 <laughs> days. <laughs> Getting the jokes out. Yep, gotta get some out. <laughs> This is United in Grief, which I have interpreted as being very much about retail therapy. Yeah. When he says, I grieve different, he's saying he copes with his pain by spending money. Yes. But also, the double entendre that I see there is that he grieves when he makes music. Yeah. And that makes him money. Yeah. To then spend. Yeah, it's a cyclical thing Exactly. Here. Like, his pain has been turned into money. Right. And then the money he spends- Is his coping mechanism. Is his coping, his coping mechanism with the pain. Yeah. Sex and materialism both being used as coping mechanisms for Kendrick. Yeah, and like you said, both being brought out by the music. You know, he's having sex on tour. Yeah. Because he's making the music. Exactly. Yeah. All right, let's get into the N95. Now, N95 is called N95 because it's the mask. Yeah, it's the official mask of COVID. <laughs> it's like, you know, you have the official beer of the NFL. The N95 is the official mask of the COVID pandemic. And I will admit that I, I kind of roll my eyes at this point in COVID conversation timeline. Yeah. I do kind of roll my eyes at, at the mask being used as like the mask that we're wearing socially, yeah. like that whole thing. Because it's just, it's a medical, like, people are wearing it to protect each other right. and themselves from a global pandemic. Yeah, you it's know? used as a symbol of like what's hiding behind that, you know, or yeah. like once you remove that, what's actually there? Like he says things like that in the album or like once you remove the, the mask, the Birkin bag and all these things you've acquired, you're ugly as fuck. Right. So this lyric here, let's think about this for a second. Let's go. Tell me what you would do for aesthetic. Let's go. Would you sell your soul on credit? Let's go. Would you sell your bro for leverage? Let's go. So this I interpret is another thing. Uh, Kendrick kind of paints himself as existing in the real world and a lot of people existing in some sort of pedantic internet world yeah. and people actually sacrificing things in their real life for points in this in invisible game on the yeah. internet. And 95 is one of those songs that I think gains context as the album goes on. When I first heard it, I didn't pick up on these things. It felt like he was just critiquing on face value things like ego, flexing, vapid music, new rollout strategies, streaming era, worshiping idols, fake wokeness. Like yeah. he lists all of these things and critiques people for indulging in those things. Mm -hmm. But then they got they get kind of recontextualized as the album goes on as coping mechanisms for pain. Right. That he then realizes he's guilty of, just not the exact same ones. Yeah, exactly. You know? He's recognizing his own like self-righteousness. Yeah. Constantly. He did that in Damn and he does it right in your face in this album. Yeah, and every other album has right. a song like this. Yeah. You know, it'll have like Humble or it'll have mm -hmm. King Kunta. Yeah. It'll really go at people for their things, other rappers specifically, that's right. his competitive edge. Yeah. But this one, he allows it to stand there and that's what it felt like. It felt like the DNA of this yeah. album where yeah. I was like, oh shit, this one's crazy. Yeah. But then he changes how it feels as the album goes on. Yeah. So you re-listen to it and you're like, oh. And then, okay, obviously, yeah. what the fuck is cancel culture, dog? So the way he talks about cancel culture this also gains context as the album go on and right. we'll get deeper into the, this topic as we get into some of these other songs. But I do think that cancel culture is a phrase that holds a lot of weight as a buzzword. Yeah, absolutely. You, you hear it and a lot of people roll their eyes or like I remember seeing as this album was 
this album got released and people on Twitter were listening to it for the first time, like, uh oh, Kendrick Lamar cancel culture bar. Right. This is a much deeper conversation about cancel culture than I've heard any other right. rapper specifically talk about. And it gains so much nuance as the album goes on. But I will say, as you hear it in this one, it again is one of those where you're like, uh oh. It's kind of an eye roller. Yeah. Oh, you worried about a critic? That ain't protocol. Bitch. That one's for Fantano. Blah. <laughs> <laughs> Worldwide Steppers. Yep. The title track of the first album. Which is interesting because it's Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers, but the first side is Big Steppers and the second half is Mr. Morale. Yeah. yeah. Mirror. Mirror. Oh, I'd never thought about that. The two albums are mirrors of each other. And so it's presented as Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers. And it's the Big Steppers and Mr. Morale. Because you're seeing the mirror. Whoa. And the last track is mirror. That is, I I literally did not think about that. Kind of gives you chills when you realize shit yeah. like that. Like, yeah. holy God. Uh -huh. Like, it is so thought out. So Worldwide Steppers is a complicated one. He spends mm -hmm. the first verse talking about his complicated feelings about having sex with white women yep. as a black man. Yeah. And then the second verse, he spends feeding into the over overall narrative of the album, which is that everyone participates in evil in some way. Yes. But this time through the lens of charity work. Right. Which I've never heard anybody speak about this way. So we have your favorite lyrics here first. Hollywood corporate in school teaching philosophies. You either gonna be dead or in jail. Killer psychology. Silent murderer. What's your body count? Who your sponsorship objectified so many bitches, I killed their confidence. What the? I was doing yeah, your thanks. part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, this is, it's just brilliant. He's speaking about like these multitudes of ways to like kill personalities and actual death. Yeah. And so you have like these things being taught in school that lead to violence or whatever. Like he's critiquing curriculum yeah. at large. And then he's talking about how the little things he does to participate in that evil you were talking about and he's killed all these people's confidence by mistreating, you know, women throughout his life. Yeah, and then this is my favorite lyric on the entire album, which is my last Christmas toy drive in Compton handed out eulogies, not because the rags in the park had red gradient, but because the high blood pressure flooded the catering. It's a double entendre yeah. first about gang violence right. and then high blood pressure. So yeah. blood pressure and blood pressure. Right. Talking about the small ways that even in doing something that he thinks is good for his community, he's giving impoverished people food that is bad for them yes that eventually will lead to poor health and people that cannot afford the medical care necessary to deal combat with the, those yeah. things you know and that's a huge problem in impoverished communities everywhere is that the food that they do have access to is so bad for them that it creates health it's a, a terrible cycle right everything is a combination of good and bad right some of those bad things can literally lead to the deaths of other people yeah and then some things are demonized where you look at somebody who goes out and, and kills somebody of course that's morally bad everybody yes. will agree but a lot of people will think that these other things that are perceived as good they'll be like that was a good thing that he did yes but he is willing to sit and analyze and be like but look think about the bad result it's result versus intent yeah so he says the noble person yes. that goes to work and pray that like they're supposed to slaughter people too your murder's just a bit slower right if you participate in capitalism at large, at yeah. large you are participating in the killing of people and if you're not willing to sit and analyze that then you're going to demonize people who hurt people hurting people yes and you're going to glorify people who are killing people as well but covering it by looking like looking like the good guy. The thin veil of charity and like this whole idea of self-righteousness in general. Yeah. This is one of my favorite lines on the album as well, which is Photoshop and lies and motives. Hide your eyes, then pose for the pic. So this to me is about like Photoshopping comes before posing for the pic, which is people think about how they will be perceived before they even do an action. Yeah. So it's the idea <laughs> that you're Photoshopping before the picture's even taken. You're gonna Photoshop out the motive of the thing that you're gonna do. Right. Then you're posing for the pick. You're hiding your eyes and posing for the pick. Yeah. So you're presenting nope. yourself in a false way already. Yeah. And then taking the picture. You're doing something because of how you're gonna be perceived for it. Yeah. Not because of the actual result of your action. Right. Yeah. Think about how many times you've heard, and maybe this is just coming from a privileged perspective, how many times I've heard somebody talk about giving money to charity and then say, it's a tax write-off. Oh, all the countless You know what I mean? That's yeah. countless times people will, like, then are you doing it for the reason that, are you doing it to help people? Or mm -hmm. would you do it if it wasn't gonna help you in some way? Exactly, that's you know? the better question. Yeah. Is like, are you gonna go to the extent to help others if you get no benefit from it? 
because honestly, it's spoiled from the get if there is a benefit for the philanthropist. I, absolutely. Then you it's know? not, that's not charity. Right. Then it's transactional. Yeah, it's something else. Yeah. 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 We're YouTubers. It's like Logan Paul filming himself giving money to a homeless person. Yeah. It's like Mr. Beast. To an extent. Mr. To yeah. an extent. Great example. That, Mr. Beast is the great example. I mean, his whole, his whole shtick though is like he is presenting himself doing things for others. Now, Father Time is a song all about daddy issues and how that's impacted Kendrick's personality as a competitive person, as a masculine person. Yeah. This song, I think, interestingly starts with Whitney, his partner, telling him he needs therapy and him saying like, Man. Real, men, real men don't need therapy. Right. Like, so the first lyric I have is daddy issues all across my head, told me fuck a foul, I'm teary eyed, wanna throw my hands, I won't think out loud. So this is just, it's basketball. Yep. It's, it's out there playing a sport, fuck a foul, can't call a foul. Nope. Have you ever played pickup ball anywhere? If you call, you can't call a foul. Yeah, and like, this is like a small, it's like a microcosm of people telling you to get therapy. Like you, you as the manly man on the court cannot call a foul because no one can hurt you. Yes. And like no one can hurt you enough to go into therapy, like in life. Either. Yeah, and then it's reacting with violence rather than words. Yes. And this is Kendrick's definitive statement that he is using his words and his thoughts instead of mm -hmm. his actions. That's what this a lot of what this album's about. Yeah. So then we got Rich Spirit, kind of a goofy track, a little bit. The content's all there, obviously, and the narrative keeps going, but it's like the beat for me that is just seems so strange. Yeah, we'll get into the production of it later, yeah. but it's yeah, it's like a West Coast DJ yeah. Mustard type beat. Yeah. <laughs> so it is funny. <laughs> kind of threw me for one. Yeah. The first lyric I have is funny. Uh why are you lying on Benjamin? He turned in his grave. That's when people keep it a hundred. Yeah. So Benjamin Franklin is turning in his grave. Yes. <laughs> the face of the hundred dollar bill. Although I do think the cancel culture bar and the N95 song title are meant to kind of pull people in as like bait. It's kind of like an eye roller so that you'll then listen to what he has to say. I do think lines like, I pray to God you actually pray when somebody dies. Thoughts and prayers way better off timelines. Just for as strong as Kendrick's pen is in every other way, some of the commentary comes off a little bit stale. That's yeah. all I'm saying. Yeah, you know? absolutely. You know? Then we have your least favorite lyrics on yeah. the record, which are frat brother, real, that brother, we just up the score. Give me dat, brother. Spirit medium. I don't rap, brother. We're heading there now. Are you strapped, brother? Now, I don't dislike these lyrics. My problem here in this like verse is just, I know it's a reference to Family Ties, but it just feels like a rehashed thing that like when I heard Family Ties, I was like, whoa, who are you right. saying, brother? Like, yeah. it, that's just interesting. The way he was saying it, the way he delivered it is almost like he's putting on a voice, you know? Yeah. And then to hear it again here, I guess it just wore off a little bit on me. But we've had a conversation about this. Yeah, so I read a genius annotation, an unreviewed one for what it's worth, that was saying that he was kind of comparing frats and gangs here. Yeah. And I could easily see that. But to me, the way that I interpreted this lyric was more that he's commenting on trauma from gangs and street shit being turned into entertainment has yeah. inevitably allowed some of that language to escape the mouths of people who don't understand it at all. Yeah, be used in a nonchalant, almost humorous way. Yeah, and not just Kendrick's music. Like no, a yeah, ton yeah. of a ton of popular rap music. It's made a lot of language from that music become a part of the lexicon of even frat culture. Right. So you can walk into a frat house and hear people saying gang gang. Right. Right. And so I'm, I I just read it as like, it comes off soulless now that it's been passed on to a group of people who don't understand it. So yeah. it's the idea of turning trauma into entertainment and the uh, end results of those things. Yeah. Picking least favorites on this album is really a challenge because yeah. everything does have meaning and like a place. So I didn't put down any lyrics for We Cry Together, but that is the song where Kendrick and uh, actress Taylor Page argue back and forth mm -hmm. over what is like a Griselda type beat, yeah. essentially. And I think this song is absolutely brilliant. It's a masterpiece. Uh, it's one of my favorite songs on the album for sure. Reminiscent of, of For Free off of To Pimp a Butterfly yeah, exactly. in a certain way. Yeah, yeah. Very conversational. It also references the movie Poetic Justice, yep. where Tupac is yelling out of the out of the van, yeah, yeah. like fuck you, fuck you, back and forth. They're like referencing that. I mean, essentially this whole song is just about like aggressive or violent language and then then turned sexual right. at the end, both of those things being tap dancing around the conversation. Yes. So they didn't have the real conversation that no. they wanted to have. They said a bunch of other things. And then they end up having sex. And then sex. they end up having sex, which- Instant gratification. Yeah. You know what I mean? You get instant gratification for saying those mean things when you know you're gonna get a rise out of someone. And then by the end, when you're tuckered out, the instant gratification is to have sex. Yeah. That's like a real, real human thing. Yeah, yeah. totally. And it feels so, as theatrical as it is, it feels almost like you're 
like ear to the door. Totally. You know, I did see somebody on Twitter say, if you relate to this conversation, please break up, <laughs> <laughs> which, you know, is yeah. fair. Yeah. The toxicity is it's, it's palpable. Toxic. It's very toxic. <laughs> Purple Heart. This has all of my least favorite lyrics on yeah. the entire album. Through first listen was my favorite song. I love how triumphant it sounds. We'll get into it in yeah, production yeah. too, but I mean, I love the big band energy, the very ascendant thing. Mm -hmm. I love where Ghostface Killer comes in too. Yep. It's just, you'll see. These are the lyrics. The emoji heart my family pictures bar. It's just from Kendrick. I don't know. There's yeah. something just out of touch about some of this stuff, you know? Whole life been social distant. I've just heard these jokes too many times. Yeah. It feels like, all right. It's been said. It's been said. They gonna judge your life for a couple likes on the double tap. Drake could say this. Yes, exactly. That's kind of what I mean. These just come off like Drake bars. Yeah. He's setting a table for such a bigger, like human discussion. And then when you kind of boil it back down to, oh, you, people do anything for likes. It's like, all right, like, come on. We're talking about generational trauma here. <laughs> there aren't a lot of funny bars on this yeah. record. And so I just wanted the ones that are like these to be funny and yeah. they aren't. And yeah. that was my only complaint with that. Fair enough. But I'm not in the music business. I'm in the human business. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we are onto the second disc here. Mm -hmm. This song I have perceived to be about proving people wrong and kind of the expectations placed on Kendrick, but yeah. also on everybody. Yeah. And how he derives motivation from doubt. Anytime I couldn't find God, I still could find myself through a song. Many find their life in a phone. This is one of my favorite lines in the whole album. I don't like the the many find my yeah. life in the in the phone. I don't know? need that one, but I love how you can always find yourself through music. Yeah, music as music as catharsis. Yeah. yeah, and it's really hard when you tell yourself, you just try and say, oh, I'm gonna find God. Like that is a, an impossible journey. Yeah. And so he continues to find himself through music and it's getting him closer to what he thinks is God. Then we have Crown, which I think is about the more you accomplish, the more is expected of you. Absolutely. He uses two perspectives on this, like uh, lending family money, Mm -hmm. So he thought that would bring people closer to him by right. helping them out, but really it made them expect things from him. Yes. And then his fan base, who he releases music, they praise him for that music. Then they forget about it. And then they will, they'll, he says like, quick, quickly the amnesia, I forget what the line is, but essentially like, they'll forget about what you've done for them if the next one doesn't do the same thing for them. Yeah. It's what have you done for me lately? And so he's saying by choosing to be that person, not only in his family's lives, but as a musician, yeah. he is putting these crazy expectations on himself mm -hmm. and allowing other people to have that relationship with him where they expect things from him all the time. Yeah. I can't please everybody. Yes. That's what he says in the song. And the refrain, the constant refrain in this song, heavy is the head that chose to wear the crown. Is that a Bible verse? It's a, it's a Bible reference. Yeah. He can be so self-aware at times, it's scary. Now, Silent Hill, I think, works as a puzzle piece at this part of the album, not only because it tees up Kodak Black, which we will discuss in the features section, e even though it's kind of like a cheeky little refrain, the yeah. pushing people off of him thing, it is the idea of the expectations. He has said like, fuck the expectations. He's choosing him, which yeah. we'll, we'll get into as well. But, um, all right, then we have Savior Interlude, wow. which, yes, Savior Interlude is insane. It's amazing. <laughs> so this is important in uh, chronologically. You have Kodak's verse, and then you have Eckhart Tolle, who says, if you derive your sense of identity from being a victim, let's say bad things were done to you as when you were a child, and you develop a sense of self that is based on the bad things that happened to you. So this informs the Kodak Black thing, which yeah. we will get into, but also informs Baby Keem, Absolutely. which follows directly. Overall, Keem uses this interlude to talk about his upbringing and his success, mm -hmm. and I think the most interesting part about it is that a lot of what Kendrick is reflecting about throughout this album Keem's in that position right now, but yeah. he's also standing next to him. So he's yeah. learning, inevitably going to learn things from Kendrick, having him be a part of this album, also be his cousin and be a part of his life, mm -hmm. and has witnessed a lot of what Kendrick did. He will go on to not repeat as many mistakes, but he's a young artist. You can he, you can hear it in his voice, yeah, his the way he's talking about those things. He's still using it to flex. Exactly. His perspective can't be as grandiose as Kendrick's. Yeah. I mean, he says, he's like, I watched Keem buy four cars in four months, yeah. and then says, like, the, the family cycle. He has to watch him do those things and make those mistakes if they are mistakes, yeah. you know? And he also says, tight bitch, put a perky in her salad. Now explain that. Hmm. Now salad is mostly consistent. It's a cold dish. Vegetable is usually a lettuce base and some other accoutrements. And by putting a perky into that salad, you will not only reap the benefits, nutrients that are in vegetables, but you also get high. Yeah. And being a tight bitch. Right you know, maybe you'll be loosened up hmm. by said pain reliever. Again, beautiful album. <laughs> An amazing feat, <laughs> yeah. really. Of lyricism, absolutely. Of yeah. rhetoric. Yeah, totally. <laughs> All right, let's get into Savior. Mm -hmm. So Savior starts with, Kendrick made you think about it, but he's not your savior. 
Cole made you feel empowered, but he is not your savior. Future said, get a money counter, but he is not your savior. And then Bron made you give us flowers. He's yeah. not your savior. Mm -hmm. So this is, it's funny. Yeah. I, it's its supposed to be serious and it is. It is yeah. serious, but it's also funny. Just yeah, and he's doing that voice. Yeah. I just picture him with like glasses on and a little pointer every time he uses that voice. Future said, get a money counter, but he is not, not your, your savior. savior. Like, this yeah. is like the very yeah. deep, raspy teacher mm -hmm. voice. I, I do, I love it. So a big part of savior is... Kendrick's saying, don't worship anyone, but also don't crucify anyone. Yeah. I think that's the juncture in the album that he's at, where he's saying like, I'm not your savior. Don't worship me, but also don't crucify anybody. It's like all more nuanced than that. Yes. You know, seen a Christian say the vaccine, the mark of the beast. Then he caught COVID and prayed to Pfizer for relief. Then I caught COVID and started to question Kyrie. Yeah. This I is, knew Kyrie was going to get brought up in this album before yeah, it came out. Totally makes sense. Yeah. But this is a lot of people stand right here. I feel like yeah. Kendrick, he's not worried about how he's perceived. That's actually one of the like mission statements of the album is he's going to say how he actually feels. Mm -hmm. And he has received backlash for a lot of stuff on this album. Yes. And then this all plays into this, the struggle for the right side of history independent thought is like an eternal enemy capitalist posing as compassionate to be offending me exactly so we talked about this already but like i do think people care a little bit more about how they're perceived as being right rather than actually forming their opinion and feeling like it's true to who they are yeah and the nature of capitalism like perverting charity in general to be profitable. And also beyond that, I think people are protecting their ways of making money. They yeah. think that if it affects their career negatively, they'll say something that they don't believe yep. if, if it serves to make them money, to yeah. continue to make them money, or they're worried about it. The other opinions stopping their way of making money. A lot of people are worried that they're going to say the wrong opinion and then their job will go away. So or when referencing athletes or musicians, what is your corporate sponsor telling you and where does your own ideals lie? Are your ideals Nikes or do you have your own? Like, yeah. Then we have anti-diaries. Yeah. I mean, this is going to be the toughest conversation. Absolutely. So in this song, Kendrick recounts his relationships with two trans family members, his mm -hmm. aunt and his cousin, and how that affected not only his family, but also his relationships with his friends and then ultimately his religion. Yes. Now, during this song, Kendrick does use the F slur Mm -hmm. multiple times. And while I object to the use of that word, no matter what, I understand why Kendrick used it in this context. I think it's a hard pill to swallow overall. Yeah. And again, you know, Kendrick is a straight man. We're two straight men sitting here. I look at the way that Kendrick talks about this as honest from his perspective. Yeah. And also in line with kind of his idea throughout this album that he cares more about the conversation that he's having than how he's going to be perceived. Again, he's having to admit the mistakes he's made in the past to actually heal and move forward and be better instead of just clouding them up or like blanking them out. Yeah, totally. I'm, I'm never going to say that again and that therefore I'm better, in his mind, isn't actually correcting the wrong. No. It's the, the recognition of it. And now from this point on, we can move forward and truly be better. Yes. What I will say overall, though, is that however trans people and other members of the LGBTQIA plus community react to this is valid. Yeah. Because it's about them. Right. Kendrick is only giving his perspective as somebody with those people in his life. Something very nuanced. Kendrick is not trans yes. and neither are we. However they feel about it is valid to their experience. Yeah. If they think that using that word is a net negative no matter what, if putting that word in this many people's heads yeah. is overall negative, then there is some merit to that because yeah. that is going to affect their lives more than it's going to affect ours. Right. So I would say to anybody who feels a certain way about this song or feels a way about the backlash about this song, listen to what trans people have to say about yeah. it. That being said, just talking about what Kendrick says here, about how he interacts with these people being parts of his life, mm -hmm. of his life, and the things he used to say when he was younger being insensitive, and then taking that journey all the way till he's arguing with his pastor, standing up for his trans cousin, right. saying, do we not love our neighbor? And going to bat for that and saying, I chose humanity over religion is something a lot of people can learn because it's not even just religion. People have political ideologies, yeah. they have peer friend groups with culture, things mm -hmm. that you feel like you can't say because of the people that you're around. Things you feel like you should say because you're around right. people who speak that way. Yeah, willingness to participate, to, to fit in. You have to choose humanity. Then he takes it to a conversation that he did have with his cousin where he was talking about how words can be absent of intent. He's saying like, I said that word, but I didn't mean anything by it. So it's not that big of a deal. His cousin challenges him by saying, well, you brought up that girl on stage, which was a show I believe in Alabama. Alabama, yeah. where he brought up a white fan on stage. It was very viral for a moment. Yeah. And she was performing Mad City with him and 
wrapped the N word. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, Kendrick took the mic from her and then everybody on the internet had all all this stuff to say about it saying, well, was the word absent of intent there? That is the overall conversation. Kendrick is realizing that the intent is baked into that word. Yes. You can't remove the meaning of a word from it. From someone else's perspective. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's a super important song in the context of the album. Absolutely. It almost feels like we it's a build up until like this point and then there's a little bit of an emotional release after this. It's a touchy subject overall, yeah. obviously. And I think Kendrick knew that this was going to be talked about from many different perspectives. And mm-hmm. I think all of those perspectives are important at the moment. Yeah. It's not my place to say at all what the impact of this song will be, but I think it is good that people are having conversations about yeah. it. And it's just coming from his mouth. Although he does use inflammatory language in the process, it's a monumental step in a way of someone of his stature to totally. open up this conversation. Then we have Mr. Morale, which is very similar in lyrical content to Mother I Sober, yeah. but on a much more lively pop centric song. Yeah. So it almost like went by me the first time I it, heard it. Completely did to me. Like I didn't know what he was talking about yeah. until I like paid attention after Mother I Sober. Yeah. So I have here. I, I think about Robert Kelly. If he weren't molested, I wonder if life will fail him. This is about R. Kelly. Yeah. And again, about the cycle of abuse and generational trauma. Um, I think it's interesting that he brings up R. Kelly in We Cry Together. Like, shut the fuck up, you still listen to his music. Yeah, while his girlfriend's trying to call him out. For being responsible for all these, like, huge overarching problems. Mm -hmm. Like, participating in, you know, toxic masculinity or even rape culture. Like, all of those things. This is a thought that is a pretty ugly thought. Yeah. How would it be different if this had, if this hadn't happened to R. Kelly? Yeah, if he didn't experience trauma in his childhood. And you have to be able to, it's a point he brings up, is you have to be able to see as hard as it is, you have to see like the perpetrator of evil as a victim as well. Yes. You know. Okay. So then at the end of Mr. Morale, we mm-hmm. have another thing from Eckhart Tolle, which is uh, people get taken over by this pain body because this energy field that almost has a life of its own, it needs to periodically feed on more unhappiness. Mm-hmm. So when bad things happen to somebody, like he said earlier, they develop a part of their personality that is based on those bad things that happen to them. That pain body that is now created as a part of somebody, it feeds on more unhappiness in that it finds somebody else to take advantage of. Yes. It passes it on. Mm-hmm. And I think that's an important to bring up because he's talking about so much of that, whether it's be with R. Kelly, whether it be with Kodak Black. There's so many examples that he uses in this album of like- His partner. Yeah, Kendrick himself too. Yeah, Kendrick himself. Then we have Mother I Sober, which is also- Heartbreaking. And absolutely one of the heaviest songs I've ever heard Kendrick Lamar make. Yes. This starts out with him recounting a time where his mother had been questioning him whether his cousin had sexually abused him. Mm -hmm. While Kendrick continuously says no. No one else believes him. No one believes him. And he felt that he didn't understand why he was being questioned this way. Yeah. And that imprinted on him as a young age that has now come back to him years later. And then he's realizing now as an older man, like why he was being questioned that way after seeing his mother be abused and learning about her abuse and witnessing her abuse, he was able to understand that she was trying very hard to make sure that didn't happen to him. Yeah. And seeing how other people, like he says, my mother's brother told me he got revenge for what happened to her face. Yes. So he saw a lot of fallout of people around him being abused and then saw how that made everybody act. Yeah. So whether it be his uncle, his mother, or even his friends, he saw people in his life be victims of violence and how that made them respond with violence. Yeah. And that obviously creates more cycles. Mm -hmm. And then I think what is the most interesting part of the song is that he says this, I know the secrets every other rapper sexually abused. I see him daily burying their pain in chains and tattoos. This is him recognizing people in his life having been abused and then seeing those patterns in other rappers and being able to identify it as like, oh, they are victims. So the things that he was condemning earlier about like, Exactly. All of that materialism, all of the, that retail ego, therapy, all of that. Yeah. All that retail therapy that he is even guilty of. He now recontextualizes it right here and says, oh, now I understand what they were going through and why they did that. Right. And encouraging kind of everybody to do that same thing of being like, when you see a bad action, you got to go bad action. Why'd they do it? What led us here? What are they a victim of? You yeah, know? exactly. That just level of growth is what everybody like hopes for in their own life. Totally. Is to get to that point where you can see bad action actors or bad actions and not view them just based on that. Like Mm -hmm. having true good judgment is such a difficult thing. And he does it on the album. Yeah. From N95 to Mother S. Sober, he takes that whole journey to like 
really be empathic all the way yeah. through, you know? Yeah. Broadly, this album comes down to a central theme that for me is stop tap dancing around the conversation. Now, this can be perceived as just, you know, beating around the bush or right. whatever the phrase is, like stop tap dancing around the conversation, mm -hmm. like get to the heart of it, get to the core of it. Don't have the shallow version of the conversations about these things. Mm -hmm. But I think what he's really saying is stop performing. Tab dancing as an art of performance. Yeah. He's saying that we're too busy worried about how we're perceived in these conversations to to truly have the real one. Yeah. So I see it as like, that's why he has so much critique for social media. He has so much critique for disingenuous charity work. Other colleagues in the music industry. He critiques the frontward facing social justice thing yeah. of trying to have these conversations so that you can look good while you have them. You can look like you're on the right side of history. And then the real conversation is beneath that and it's uglier and there's so much nuance to it. You're gonna look bad. He says the F slur, he talks about R. Kelly. He yeah. brings Kodak Black onto this album. Yeah. Like these things inevitably look bad. In order to get to the place he wants to bring you to, these are the symbols and subjects that need to be forward facing. Like yeah. you said. Deep down, he knows what people are going to say yeah. about some of these choices that he's decided to make, but has decided that the core conversation that he's having is more important than how he looks. Yeah. Fix yourself and that will in turn fix others. All right. Well, <laughs> not as good as the Jack Harlow album. I will say that. You, yeah. I was going to say the same thing. Uh, <laughs> and I know this is probably our funniest video so yeah, far. Yeah. So uh, make like and subscribe. Make sure to like and subscribe <laughs> for that. Let's get into the features. We've okay. spoken about the album broadly and now we're going to break down our categories. So a lot of features on this album. I think overall, all of the features did really well. No, I completely agree. They're and placed in the right places too. Again, with our lyrics, it's really hard to pick a least favorite in what is an amazingly profound, like can be considered a masterpiece by many. It's gonna be hard to say, well, that one sucked because everything's thought out. Nothing is done here thoughtlessly. So my least favorite feature on the album is Summer Walker on Purple Hearts. Yeah. I don't think she did a bad job by any means. It's just the one that I felt like served the least purpose, I guess. Yeah, it feels like a bit of a, a detour. And my least favorite for whatever reason is, I think I have beef with Sampha in general. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why it is. We were kind of talking about this yesterday. It just, his voice and the way it like interacts with other, like at, when he's featured on a song always feels a little strange to me. Yeah. Um, it's something to do with the mix. It's something to do with his accent, his vibrato. Like it just, it's not my favorite. It's one of my favorites. Yeah. I love Sanfa on there, but I do have my Sanfa hot take yeah. if you'd like it. Yeah, I would. Uh, Sanfa kind of sounds like City in Color. That's my hot take. I is can that see that. Since the first time I heard Sanfa on um, Subtract songs yeah. back in the day, I thought, he kind of sounds like Dallas Green of City and Color fame. Shout out so. City and Color, your favorite. Yes, my favorite feature on the record is Taylor Page on We Cry yeah. Together. Unbelievable performance. Yeah, just and from incredible. someone who's not a rapper. Like she's yeah. just an actress. I mean, right. she might be a rapper, but like not a career rapper. Yeah. You know, he's bringing on an actress to play this part. Yeah. Just how emotional she sounds, the way her voice goes, but just like the ability to act all of that out. It's so impressive. You like, needed an actress to do that. And my favorite feature is Baby Keem, specifically on Savior Interlude. Yeah. Just I as his own song, pretty much. Yes. We touched on it when we went through the lyrics, just the way that adds perspective into everything is so well done. His performance is just really well done. And then he goes on to sing the hook in Savior, which might be one of my favorite hooks on the whole album. Yeah, uh, Baby Keem's incredible on this album, even on N95 with just yeah. ad libs, but he also produced that beat. He produced some stuff on this record, but um, yeah, he's great on here. Yeah. Everybody is though. I mean, I, like I said, I like Sampha. I like Ghostface Killa's verse as Me that too. inspirational end of Purple Heart. Me too. I enjoy Beth Gibbons from Portishead. Yeah. Uh, just in that really solemn Mother I Sober sample. Blast's hook on Die Hard is so good. Yeah. It has really grown on me a bunch. Like I just really, I return for that, even though the, the Kendra's not saying that much on that song, but right. like that song is so fun to listen to. Before we leave the feature section, I do want to talk about the inclusion of Kodak Black, which yeah. um, obviously a controversial decision of Kendrick to use him here. And um, one that really bugged me at first. It did for me as well. I have been very critical of Kodak Black in my personal life. I don't know how much I've said about it mm. on camera, but the things that he has not only been accused of, but have pled guilty to yeah. are horrifying. Yeah. Um, more than I think the general public knows. I don't hear it talked about the same way as some other people who have been quote unquote canceled, you know? Yeah. It's not just gun charges or standing with Trump, like it's sexual abuse. He yeah. is he is guilty of those things. 
And what I think Kendrick is doing here is picking maybe the most challenging example he can to show somebody who is a victim of things in their upbringing and then has continued the cycle of abuse. Whether or not it is actual ab like sexual abuse that Kodak Black has been a victim of, his upbringing traumatized him. Yeah. And he's then acted either violently or with his ego or maliciously towards others. He has repeated a lot of those things and he's very public with them. He yeah. brags about them on the album that we're talking about. Yeah. He's giving everybody an example right in front of them of somebody that they can write off as just a perpetrator of horrible things and saying, think about if he is a victim. If you believe in what Kendrick has said this entire album, then you will arrive on the other side somehow trying to understand why Kodak Black has done the things that he's done. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I'm even all the way there yet because I do still think it was a bad idea to include Kodak Black on this album, but maybe in a year I'll understand it more. That's what I was just why about to say. he's here. But at the same time, like I want him to not be here for the yeah. sake of people who have been through those things to not be traumatized listening to this album. Yeah. I want that for those people who rightfully so don't have the the understanding yet to try to see past the bad things that he's done right. to what he might have been through. Because that in itself is a place of privilege. Yeah. To be able to see past those things is to be absent of them in your own life. Exactly. And I think the profound goal here is to create a dialogue in society that in 10 years time, this album will have like shifted consciousness or whatever, the way we think and the way we digest things to a place that, you know, his inclusion in the album is meaningful, I guess. All right, production on this album. It was so hard for me to pick a beat that I didn't like on this album. I like everything here. Yeah, I like every beat. I like this production better than I like Damn's production. Yeah, I will say that Damn, To Pimp a Butterfly, Good Kid, Mad City all have this palette that is so unique to just that, that this felt like a smorgasbord first time I listened to it. Yeah, it's a lot going on. Like the fact that N95 is on the same album as stuff like Mother I Sober, yeah. it doesn't sound anywhere close to each other. And I do think that he touches on the production styles of all of his previous three albums as well. I'm surprised at how different everything sounds, but also how good it all sounds. It all sits on the same level of quality. The thing that ties everything together, I think, is the theme is piano. Yeah, Naked, the keys, pi naked yeah. piano shows up on almost every song. Mm -hmm. It definitely shows up on the in-between songs as you get to the bigger like hit records. Yeah. You know? What was your least favorite beat? My least favorite beat was uh, Mirror, the last song. Only because I feel like it has kind of cheesy clap on it. Yeah. Like it's just kind of like a psh, doom. Psh, like it's not, I don't hate it. And right. there's a, there's amazing violin on it. There's yeah. like whole string sections. Like it's a, it's a great beat. It's just like, to me is the one that rang a little bit cheesy. Yeah, we gotta be nitpicky here. I chose me, I'm sorry. Me I see what you're saying. It yeah. does have a weird like ambiance to it. It's just a little cheesy. That's yeah. all. My least favorite beat is kind of for the same reason it is rich spirit. Yeah. It's like the weird mustard West coast kind of beat. It just feels really out of place. It almost yeah. feels like, like the club banger or something. It's just strange production to hear Kendrick do what he's doing in this album on. Yes. Frat brother, real nigga, that brother. We just up the score. Give me that brother. See, I just dislike how Kendrick sounds on this song. Yeah. The beat itself, I really like. Like, I think it's like a, if this is a Vince Staples song. Sure, yeah. Then it's a banger. It's like one of the best produced Vince Staples songs. Yeah. But because of the way Kendrick's rapping on it, it does come off a little weird. Yeah, it then. feels strange. Yeah. But I'm still gonna, you know, I mean, that song is gonna be played by me. Um, We have the same favorite beat. Yep. Which is Silent Hill. Yeah. Which, listen, there's a lot of deep production that I love on this album. Like there's stuff that I think is so impressive. Like United in Grief is insane. Yes. N95 too is another close one that is like a just blowtorch. Like that song came on as I'm listening to it and I'm texting other people. Absolutely. I'm letting them know. I'm like crying right now. Bangers. Yeah, just yeah. an absolute banger. There's a lot of stuff I really like, but Silent Hill is just it's so hard. Yes. It's like impossibly it's hard. The silenced pistol. Yeah, the silencer. <laughs> <laughs> Pushing the snakes, I'm pushing the fakes, I'm pushing them all on me like Pushing on love me like, oh man, unbelievable! Yeah, it gives me old Monte Booker vibes too. I feel that you know, what I, I mean, feel with, that. That, with the laser sounds and the way it's kind of the way it's all composed, it's just hard. Yeah. To the, the, the 808 is just insane, juicy. No matter what I think about this album, however, I return to it, I'm gonna listen to that song 
in my car yes. all the time. That's a cruiser for yeah. sure. All right, let's get into samples. Yes. I feel like I'm entering every section by just praising how well thought out it all is. Yeah. But the samples here, like stuff that it took me 10 listens to realize why a sample was there. Yeah. It is insane sample placement on this on this album. Yeah, and it's choosy. It's not like overloaded with no. samples just for the sake of having them there. They're very thought after and add like another dimension to everything else going on. So the first one we're going to talk about is in Worldwide Steppers, where you hear the repeated, what the, the fuck? Which is a clip from a viral video from sketch comedian Rodel Ortiz, when there's no cheese at the cookout. So it's the idea that a guy who shows up that wasn't even invited to the cookout is complaining that there's no cheese there. So yes. he's like, what the fuck? <laughs> what I found to be so interesting about this is its inclusion in Worldwide Steppers is interesting because it acts as almost like comedic relief in a right. certain sense to a really heavy song. But it also is the song where Kendrick is discussing the food that he was serving being very unhealthy right. at his toy drive. So it's like an extra layer of like food service. Even when you think he's just adding something for comedic relief, you're like, oh, it's like a goofy YouTube video that he incorporated. It still has a meaning inside of the song's context, which is amazing. So let's hear the original and then we'll hear it in the context of the song. Hey, yo, what the fuck? There's no cheese. There's no cheese. <laughs> <laughs> You killed the consciousness. The Your jealousy fuck? is way too pretentious. You killed accomplishments. Niggas fuck? killed freedom. Of it almost works as like a like a DJ drama or Swizz Beats type of thing. Yeah. It feels like it's supposed to be like a hype DJ thing. Yeah. But it's from a viral video. Yeah. This song also has another really interesting sample in it. Yeah. I just noticed today on Genius that it samples John Williams theme song from Jaws. And it adds this extra depth to the baby shark line and him watching for sharks. Yeah, which we also found out through researching this that baby shark itself samples the Jaws theme. Which is interesting because in my mind, getting a John Williams sample cleared is next to like none. All right, so let's hear the Jaws theme song. <laughs> what an iconic song. <laughs> Yesterday I prayed to the flowers and trees, gratification to the powers that be, synchronization with my energy chakras. Just that back and forth, you know? Dun, 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 dun. That brings us to my favorite sample, which is what happened to that boy, Clips. And Birdman. And Birdman yep. in Savior. Yeah, which I did not pick up on at all. And then once I heard it, I was like, oh my God, it's just the, the drum beat. What happened to that boy? What happened to that boy? Awesome track. <laughs> and then, uh, let's hear it in Savior. Hey, are you happy for me? Bite they tongues and rap lyrics scared to be crucified about us. What happened to that boy just has that rhythm that is so iconic. Yeah. And then he just, to pinpoint that is just so fucking sweet. Yeah, it's <laughs> sweet. And then comes my favorite sample, just in selection, yeah. which is June by Florence and the Machine yeah. being sampled at the beginning of We Cry Together. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful song, yeah. by the way. Kendrick's always good for one of these. Yeah. You know what I mean? On Damn, there was obviously the U2. Or Mr. Twin Sister on The Recipe, which is a bonus track off of Good Kid, Mad City. Yeah. That big brass section, like yeah. those saxophones and clarinets, is just, oh, it's crazy. It really does feel like the musician's pit at a theater, yeah. like production. It really does feel like it's like, you know, the red drapes opening. Yeah. Next sample we're gonna talk about is at the end of Anti Diaries and into the beginning of Mr. Morale. <laughs> Another YouTube clip here. Yeah, I couldn't believe this one when you told me. Yeah. Kendrick chooses a 2012 clip from a YouTube channel called The Dallas Cowboys Show. Yeah. Where the host of that show is recounting his emotions after a brutal loss to the Seattle Seahawks. Yeah. <laughs> and he says, this is the worst performance I've ever seen in my whole life. <laughs> All right, let's. <laughs> you right there? <laughs> no. It was one of the worst performances I've seen in my life. I couldn't sleep. <laughs> Very impassioned reaction. Oh man, football yeah. fans are crazy. It was one of the worst performances I've seen in my life. I couldn't sleep last night. Genius is saying that he's referencing the white girl on stage with him in Alabama yeah. by saying that. And that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And like how fans reacted to that. It's just so funny that he's like, like 2012 such a YouTube show. That's 10 years ago. Football commentary. Yeah. Re like reimagined into this context. So wild. It's crazy that he did it. But yeah. um, lastly, we're going to talk about our favorite and least favorite songs on the record. Mm -hmm. My least favorite is Crown. Although I do feel like Kendrick has 
has a lot to say on this song that's important to say about not pleasing everybody, expectations from his fans, all that stuff I talked about in the lyrics section. I just find this song harder to listen to than the rest of them. Yeah, it gets very repetitive at a certain point and yeah. it is kind of a one note. On this song, it just leans too heavily into that vocal tonality that I don't usually like from Kendrick. Fair so. enough. So what was your least favorite song? Again, it's so hard. Yeah. It's so hard, but after, you know, I've made it through maybe eight or nine times now on the album, and I think Die Hard's kind of the one I, I'm just not gonna return to as much. Yeah, which is crazy to me, because I love that one's so fun to listen to, but. Yeah. It's my choice, damn it. Do you love me? Do you trust me? Can I trust you? Don't judge me. And see, even hearing the clip of it there, I want to nod my head and dance to it. Like there's no, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's still really good. It's yeah. just, that's the bottom of the list for me. It's between that one and Rich Spirit, almost mainly due to the way the production sits in contrast to the content. I do think that's going to be a funny thing as we continue to do this segment is when the worst one plays, we've listened to the record so many times oh, yeah. that we're going to be nodding. Like, like it's, it's, it's okay. Yeah, we're not going to look like we hate the songs. Yeah. You know? No, I'm not going to be like, mm, turn it off, Grant. <laughs> <laughs> even with Jack Harlow, I yeah. had the song, my least favorite song from the Jack Harlow album, I had stuck in my head walking around the house. I got a shot, it's not a pistol. Oh, yeah. Like that shit was stuck in my head a ton. I hate yeah. that song. But once you listen to a record that many times, you're- It's part of you. It's part of you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> to your favorite. Yeah, my favorite track on this album is Worldwide Steppers. Yeah. Although I don't think it's the one I'm gonna return to as often as something like Silent Hill or N95 or even Count Me Out has kind of come yeah. up as one of my favorites now, Savior. It's like my critics favorite. It's yeah. not like the one that I'm going to be playing in my car all the time. It's just the one that I think is the best song here. Mm -hmm. Man of God playing baby shark with my daughter, watching for sharks outside at the same time. Life is a protective father I kill for. Dun, 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 dun. That piano part is so good. It adds just like a this moment of release to the tension and then you're right back into it. Yeah. yeah. It crazy. almost feels like it's, I can't place it. And I, I've said this to you too. It sounds like a TV show theme song that I can't remember. Yeah. Where it's like a bunch of different screens and it's like a side scrolling thing. It's like, fuck, I can't remember it at all. It's not the house theme song. Cause for a second I was like, oh, it's like it's that, which is a banger. Yeah. It's massive attack, but yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. If somebody can help me out, it's probably not directs because there's no sample listed or anything, sure. but like, what is it? It reminds me of a theme song from a TV show. With screens. There's screens on it. <laughs> Sounds like you had a weird dream. Anyway, what's your favorite song? I had to go with the obvious pick. I tried to do the critics' favorite thing yeah. as we were sitting through here, like sitting here and taking our notes. Upon like maybe sixth listen through the album, I was like, what am I doing? N95 is my favorite song. Yeah. That's the song I'm going to listen to the most, is the most explosive, and I feel like it it like turned my brain on for the album. Like totally. it, it got me there and I was like, okay, let's go. Like whatever you gotta say, like I'm going to try. Truth, I got nothing to lose. I got problems and pools, I can swim with my feet. Camera was moving with nothing. I'm moving the family suing whatever I make. That flow is so crazy. I really got like a right up my spine. Like in the second verse, you're like, okay, he's really going. Yeah. And then it gets to the third verse and he just goes even harder. Yep. <laughs> the way the bass slides around like that ferocious cadence, it's it's amazing. That's yeah. that's Kendrick on one. Absolutely. Some of my runner ups for this, We Cry Together is probably my second favorite song on yeah. the record. I just think it's like masterfully done, but also fun to listen to. Yeah. I know you can't listen to it everywhere. Sure. Like, it's, it's like, if it came out in a coffee shop, I'd be like, no. Wait I'd be like, wrong. Wait a minute, <laughs> wrong no. Place. Let's not let this get too far. Yeah. <laughs> runner up for me, Savior. Yeah, Savior's really good. Silent Hill is just gonna be yeah. so fun to continue to listen to. United in Grief is a, an amazing listen for me each time. Like we said earlier, the production's just wild on that one yeah. it ropes you in and like yeah it's almost like a flying lotus type of production yeah. on that one like it gets into like heavy just like electronic production but yeah. then works in all of these crazy synths and it also has like the stark staccato piano at yeah. the beginning like very, just a wild adventure of a yeah. song, but. What an album, man. Yeah, what an album. I am not surprised that this album has gotten the most criticism of the last couple Kendrick Lamar albums. Mm -hmm. I do think it is more divisive. I also think it's a more challenging listen yeah. than, especially Damn. I yes. think Tim Butterfly challenged listeners and this is doing the same thing, but is maybe a little bit more musically challenging to the casual Kendrick Lamar listener. Yeah. I think this one will live a very weird life 
yeah. in the history of music. I think this will end up being critically acclaimed. Everybody's just trying to get a grasp on this album right now, yeah. trying to figure out what it's about. It took me damn near 20 listens to even feel like I had enough to say on camera, camera yeah. let alone as just a listener who isn't doing this to talk about it on, on camera and is just listening to it as a listener. It's going to take a while to sit. And I don't even know that I understand what it's about. It's just no. what, what I took from it is what I'm saying here, yeah. so. Let us know some of your favorite tracks on it. Don't rush yourself to get to any final thoughts on it. Just let it live with you, keep existing with it, and take from it what you can, and I think that's meaningful in itself. L L like Graydon said, let us know your favorite and least favorite tracks down there, but also your favorite and least favorite for the other categories. If there's a sample that you thought was cool, mm -hmm. or your favorite beat, let us know down in the comment section. Also, let us know other albums you want us to do this for. There aren't as many blockbuster releases coming up that are announced yet, and so we could go back and do the Push a T album or the Future album. Just let us know what you guys want us to talk about, and if this is your first time watching us, check out our other videos. Usually, we tell jokes and play games. <laughs> we just recently started talking about albums this way, yeah. and it's a very new segment. Other than that, like the video, subscribe, all the stuff I said at the beginning. We got our Patreon linked in the description along with a bunch of other stuff. Graydon, do you want to leave these wonderful people with some advice to leave or live their lives by? I'm going to let Kendrick do it. Oh. To whom is given, much is required now. All right, this has been High Mind TV. We love you, appreciate you, and we'll see you in the next one. Thanks, Kendrick. You know, they call Kendrick Mr. Morale. They call me Mr. More Ale. <laughs> <laughs> you do like, you I like love I, beer. IPAs especially. Uh -huh, hops. Yeah. Hops! <laughs> yeah. Can we do that again? Will you say it with me? Sure. Hops! Here's your porn box. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>